How you doing, again? Hi, how are you? Um, this week, you know, talk about Black Matter, Black Lives Matter. And I thought I was above getting angry because I didn't see the news. I realized <clears throat> that I was not above getting angry. I was so angry about what happened to the black men that got shot by the cops. And this is not some, I'm not angry because I'm seeing this for the first time. This has been going on for years since I was a little girl, from the South to New York. It's just beginning to get in the paper now, and people seeing the truth of it, because we got cameras. You understand? And I believe I, wasn't, I was above it at first. But when I was at work and other people came around, other blacks and stuff, I see them angry, and they're like, I can't talk to them. I'm just angry at what I saw, you know? If something's not done about this, if we actually don't actually pray, and meditate on this, it's going to get out of hand. Because on the streets around where I live at, the blacks think in a different way. And they think I'm very bad. I'm sorry, what was that last They're thing They're thinking very bad, and I really don't want to see this. I'm very perceptive, and my intuition is always on key. And I really don't want to see what might take place if we don't do something about it. I was told one time that we cannot solve the problem on a level that is created, but we can solve the problem on another level, and we do need to meditate on this. You see, because the Black Panthers have been given rights to carry guns at a protest, and so has the KKK, and they're going to have a protest. It's in the Metro newspaper, and they're going to have a protest in Cleveland. This is not a good thing, because all it takes is one spark to really upset this whole country. Yeah. And if we fight against each other, we shall fall. And that we don't want to see. I mean, we have our mistakes and we have our problems, but we have to do something about it. And I'm asking every last one of y'all to pray and meditate on this, that maybe we can change this because the darkness that's here is not greater than the light, but it is here. And people don't want to face it. Some people, when you talk about it, because I have white friends, you say something to them, and some say, oh, that's over there. No, it's here. And we'll come back and knock on our doors. And I have to deal with it, and I don't know, because I didn't think I would have all this anger in me, too. But I do. Thank you for your words. They were beautifully and eloquently said, so thank you. And you're absolutely correct. Um, a lot of times things are suppressed, but they can only be suppressed so long. So on one hand, it's good that stuff is coming up. But as I said in a, in a blog that I wrote the other day, the revolution has begun. The only question is whether it's going to be a revolution of love or a revolution of fear. Uh, you can either proactively participate in the revolution of love or be at the effect of the revolution of fear. But it's like I was saying earlier tonight. There's no, it's, it's, it's happening. As Cynthia has said, we all need to pray and we all need to meditate. But it's like I say tonight and I've said uh, before, we can't just say, dear God, save us from the effects. We, real healing, the Course in Miracles says, Holy Spirit works with you on the level of cause. And so we have to be willing to change on the level of cause in order to have a change on the level of effect. And so what Cynthia is saying is exactly what I was talking about tonight. You can't, can't expect, you know, God come in and make it all right unless we are willing to make it right on the level of cause. And that begins with atonement. In 1864, when uh, Abraham Lincoln <clears throat> uh, wrote a proclamation for a national day of fasting and prayer, he said that a nation must confess its sins just like an individual does. And a sin, in Course in Miracles terms, would mean the miscreative use of mind. So we begin with that. We were talking tonight already about how a nation must do just as an individual does when they talk in AA about a brutally honest moral inventory. And we have, and it's part of the irony and the journey and the drama of America, that from the very, very beginning, we have been this juxtaposition of the most enlightened, 
principles and ways that we ourselves have horrifyingly, in some cases, transgressed against the very principles on which we purported to stand. And nothing is a more dramatic example than slavery, which from the earliest days of our nation, this evil, this heinous manifestation was there. And of course, the irony, I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating, a, a horrifying a, a drama when you think of how many people who signed the Declaration of Independence, risking their lives to do so, were themselves slave owners. So our country has always been this, this juxtaposition and this drama with every generation. And our generation is no different than any other in that sense. There have been those who sought to embody and to commit the resources of the country to the effort to embody more fully the enlightened principles of equality and brotherhood and justice on which we purport to stand. And there have been those in our generation as much as any other who have sought to withdraw the resources of the nation from the effort to embody those principles. Over time, we do tend to self-correct. It was in 1864, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. A presidential pen could end, and a constitutional amendment could end, the, the evil institution. But racism didn't end. You can't, no presidential pen or constitutional amendment could eradicate racism. It could eradicate the institution, which was a manifestation of that. And that's like, it's like with the civil rights legislation. Martin Luther King said, the desegregation of the American South is the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement. The ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. Because until there's the beloved community, there will always be something. The symptom will just morph. So peoples who have been persecuted kind of know that. Generation after generation, never think you're fully home because it could rise up again in any generation. And any people who has had a history of persecution knows that. So ultimately, the issue of other generations was to eradicate externalities. And I'm not saying there are not externalities now, whether it has to, to do with police brutality, criminal uh, uh, justice inequities and in, in, in sentencing guidelines, and so forth. There are plenty of externals that need to change. But as Martin Luther King himself said, until we work on the level of cause, the ultimate changes will be temporary at best. Now, where does that begin? Where do we talk about this in the Course in Miracles all the time? Those of you who are Course in Miracles students, what's the first thing you do? Pardon? You ask for a miracle, but what that miracle is a shift in your own perception. And the issue I'm getting to here is ask what I have to surrender, where I have to atone. So, America, interestingly enough, and we've talked about this, we talk about this rather a lot right now, and I think that's good because we need to. Uh, we've used the, the example of Germany and how Germany has really cleaned up its mess since World War II. Um, it really has. It teaches its children about the Holocaust. It does full mea culpa. It doesn't pretend it was anything less evil than it was. And they have paid reparations to Jewish organizations. America won't go all the way yet. We won't bring ourselves to go all the way. And we do not teach our children. If you look, this was, there was a big deal with the Texas school book issue several, uh, several years ago. When you look at what American children are taught today, I think the civil rights movement is given like one paragraph. So too many of our children don't even know the history, right? And that's part of it, a, an absolute ignorance of, what, of the whole trajectory. Never done the full apology, never done the full mea culpa, and never paid reparations. That's one of the reasons I feel strongly about reparations. It's not an economic issue only. It is a spiritual, psychological, and emotional issue. So as we were talking about earlier tonight, there are certain things the government's not gonna do, so where does it begin? It begins with us. And so we did this, I've done this around the country. A couple of my books have this. Healing the Soul of America has it. My book, Illuminata, has it, for those of you who'd like to, uh, to, read, uh, to read it. Uh, I've done it around the country. Uh, my hope is that it, it brings some comfort, some hope, and uh, 
You know, as Gandhi talks about soul force, these things have soul force, satyagraha, that when you make changes in your heart, you actually create force. And one of the things that we have seen, unfortunately, in the world, uh, we see it today, and we even see it to some extent in our own country, very dangerously so, is when hatred becomes a social and political force. We must make love a social and political force, and that has to start with us. So for those of you who, who would like to participate in this, uh, I'm going to now lead us in a, an apology uh, from white Americans to African Americans on behalf of our country, um, to you and to your ancestors and uh, to all of your people. So to the African Americans in the room who would uh, wish and be willing to participate in this, please stand up. <clears throat> And now I'd like to ask white Americans who are sitting near you to please uh, stand up. And if the African-American uh, citizen would, would be willing to allow a white American who wishes to apologize to you and take part in this to hold your hands. And now, as I, as I speak, I'm going to ask the white Americans in the room to please repeat after me. <clears throat> on behalf of myself and on behalf of my country, to you and all African Americans, from the beginning of our nation's history, in honor of your ancestors and on behalf of your children, please hear this from my heart. I apologize. Please forgive us. With this prayer, I acknowledge the depth of the evils that have been perpetrated against black people in America. From slavery to lynchings to white supremacist laws to the denial of voting rights to all the ways, both large and small, all of them evil, all of them, evil. All of them, wrong. All of them wrong, for all the oppression, for all the oppression. And, all of the and all the injustices. I apologize. I apologize. Please, forgive us. Please forgive us for the denial of any civil rights, for, the of any civil rights. for inequalities in criminal justice, to any instances of police brutality, to the denial of opportunity for economic injustice, for any ways that a racial element has played into the perpetration of injustice. I apologize. Please forgive us. With this prayer, I acknowledge, With this prayer, I acknowledge the, beauty the beauty and the genius of your culture, the power and the genius of those who came before you, the power and the genius of your children and your descendants. And with this prayer, we pray. May your children May your, men May your men be blessed and protected. Be blessed and protected. May, your men May your men be blessed and protected. Be blessed and protected. May, your men May your men be blessed and protected. May all your men and all your women and all your children be surrounded by angels at this time. And dear God, may a great healing occur. 
We place in your hands the relationship between black and white Americans. May it be lifted high above and beyond the walls that would divide us. May our hearts be awakened to the truth of our oneness and racism and prejudice be no more. Dear God, please come upon us and heal our wounded hearts. But to you, you, my African-American fellow citizen, citizen, please accept my apology this night. night. It is for you and for your grandparents and their grandparents before them and their grandparents grandparents before them. May the screams that were not allowed be allowed now. May the cries that were never heard be heard now. May the tears that were never heard be heard now. And thus may the healing begin. The tears that we cry May they be cried. And thus in the sacred container, may the healing begin. And so it is. Amen. I'd like everyone to please be seated and remain in quiet that we might hold in silence this sacred moment. and allow whatever reaction anyone needs to have to be had. We do have cellular memory. We do. And we are screaming sometimes, the screams that our grandmothers and our grandfathers were not allowed to scream. And we are crying sometimes, the tears that our grandmothers and grandfathers were not allowed to cry. And this is the place. You know, when President Clinton said we needed to have a national conversation about race. It didn't go anywhere because without a sacred container, without a prayerful context, no one gets to go deep. You know, people who have hundreds of years of anger in their cells and rage and pain and need to apologize. This is all really good. And it's the only way. 
and everyone who is present with this, to whatever extent your own awareness, your own feelings are impacted by this, then you become in your own way, in your own life, an ambassador of the love and the feelings that you experience here. And that's the way it works. It's not a quick fix. It's a healing process. But it cannot not work. Does that make sense? I think uh, it would, I feel that it would undercut uh, the profundity of what is possible for us to have any other conversation this evening. So I would like to end with a final prayer. I'd like to thank all of you who participated in the prayer, the Apology of Atonement this evening, and that includes those of you who are on live stream, because I know that many of you uh, were participating also. The Course in Miracles says that an idea is stronger when it is shared. Enough people in this country are joining in groups of hate, and I'm really honored uh, to be among you that we might join in groups of love. <clears throat> We give to you, dear God, all of our burdens, all of our hopes and visions and dreams. We give to you the pain in anyone. We pray tonight for Casey, for the Ferez family, for Jim and Lenny and Tammy and John, for Elizabeth, for Emir, for Kim and Tracy and Ron and Rosalie, for Tom and Rhonda, for Joe and for Jackie. We give thanks for all the miracles that have occurred in our lives and we give thanks for the miracle that is occurring now. We give thanks for the miracle that is occurring, the healing that is occurring, that we know is occurring because of how many of us have our hearts open to the love that heals all things. And now we go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and there are angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. May America be healed. May the relationship between black and white Americans, dear God, be miraculously transformed. For the holiest spot on earth, we are taught, is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. And may the love that we feel in our hearts tonight wash away all hatred, wash away all violence, that there might be peace on earth as it is in heaven. And so it is, we say, amen.